Hello, and welcome to the triumphant return of Crad COVID readings. Maybe I should call it Crad post-COVID readings at this point, although it's really hard to say since COVID isn't exactly done with us yet either. Um, anyway, I took pretty much took all of 2022 off, but now that we are into 2023, I realize that I've written like a dozen more short stories <laughs> since I last did this. Um, so I've got enough to keep me going for a while at least. So, uh, I'm going to revive the feature, at least for a while, um, probably on a monthly basis, maybe on a weekly basis, I don't know, it depends on my mood and my time and any number of other things, but in any case, I'm going to kick off the new year with uh, a reading of quite possibly one of my favorite stories that I've written, <laughs> certainly one of my favorites that I've written recently. Uh, in 2019... Editor Robert Greenberger, uh, who long had a career as an editor at DC Comics and also worked at Marvel and Weekly World News and also has been a writer for many, many thousands of years, um, put together an anthology called Thrilling Adventure Yarns. Um, earlier in this series of readings, I read my story for that uh, volume, which was called Alien Invasion of Earth. And uh, there was a second volume uh, called Thrilling Adventure Yarns 2021, which obviously came out in 2021. Uh, and in 2022, Crazy 8 Press and Bob kickstarted a third volume called Thrilling Adventure Yarns 2022. Uh, and while I wasn't in the 21 volume, I was in the 22 volume with this story that I'm about to read for you, which is a two-fisted pulp classic uh, taking place uh, in the 1930s. It is called Ticonderoga Beck and the Stalwart Squad. And I'm going to read it for you now. Ticonderoga Beck and the Stalwart Squad by Keith R. Vikandra. Transcript of Movie Tone News Segment, 7 July 1938. We start with the Movie Tone News opening credits, which plays over music. Da, 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 da. Just in time for the 4th of July, Ticonderoga Beck and his stalwart squad put the kibosh on a spy ring that had been selling secrets to America's enemies. Uncle Sam could celebrate his birthday in peace, knowing that Beck was on the case and keeping the U.S. of A. safe. Beck was also responsible for saving the people of California from a poisoned water supply, courtesy the notorious gangster and former bootlegger Cool Hand McCool. Thanks to Beck, McCool got an all-expenses-paid trip up the river. We caught up with Beck at the Prunella Man Institute, his headquarters in New Paltz, New York, where the first thing he does is show his great modesty. I couldn't do any of what we do without my stalwart squad. We're a team, after all. Beck shows us the state-of-the-art laboratory where he develops all the tools of the trade he uses in his fight for freedom. I named this institute after my grandmother, Prunella Man. She was a great lady, and she helped raise me right after my parents passed, even though we were dirt poor in the Bronx. And this lab is the heart and soul of the place. A lot of my inventions have been created here. A self-made man and autodidact, Beck has taught himself all the skills he puts to use in his ongoing crusade to keep America safe. Beck makes sure we get to talk to members of his stalwart squad as well. Everyone knows his bodyguard, former heavyweight champion Sluggin Secundo Vecchia, who retired after his famous TKO against Max Schlemming in 1932. Here we see Sluggin Secundo in Beck's state-of-the-art gymnasium. It's a great, uh, how you say, privilege to be guarding the body of Ticonderoga Beck. Magnifico! Less famous is his physician, Shao Lin, though Beck has said many times that he saved his life more than once with his strange oriental voodoo. Honor it is to be serving such a man as Ticonderoga Beck. Uh, forgive me, my English is not great. Rounding out the stalwart squad is Beck's chauffeur, pilot, and mechanic, Gregory Johnson here giving a tune-up to Beck's famous aeroplane, Monty's Honor. Mr. Beck, he the best. I show enough love working for him. My sister, she do too. And I love flying to planes and driving to cars and fixing them up for Mr. Beck. Lest we forget the fairer sex, Beck also has two great gals pitching in to help out. Gregory's sister Mary is the cook here at the Institute, and her mouth-watering meals are the bee's knees. And then there's Beck's lovely secretary, the beautiful Della Mays, who keeps Beck from forgetting his appointments. But it all comes back down to Ticonderoga Beck himself, who we see here talking to a group of school children in his old stomping grounds of New York City. Remember, pals, Ticonderoga's three big L's. What are they? Look! Listen! Learn! Exactly. 
Remember those three things, and you'll always be the best. And there goes Monty's honor, flying off into the night, ready for Ticonderoga Beck's next adventure. Dun, 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 dun. Prunella Man Institute, New Paltz, New York, 5 July, 1938. Ticonderoga Beck watched as the truck from Movie Tone News drove down the long and winding road that led away from his redoubt on Mohonk Mountain in New Paltz. Secundo Vecchia and Chow Lin stood on either side of him. The former boxer stood, towered over the others at six foot six. Secundo was the only person who ever made Beck, who was six foot two, feel short. Both men wore tailored suits for their appearance on the newsreel. Secundo's a tan one, while Beck's was navy blue. Meanwhile, Chow Lin, who stood at only five foot nine, wore a red and gold patterned Chinese tang suit with a matching hat. All three wore pins with the stylized B logo that was also emblazoned on the front door, on the sides of all their vehicles, on their stationery, and everything else they could label. Secundo said, in perfect English, with only a minor trace of an accent, A very good job, Ty. Very good. Chow Lin spoke with no trace of an accent when he said, It was not necessary for you to insist that we all be interviewed as well. Yeah, it was, pal. Beck threw up his hands. You guys are the stalwart squad, and the ones who actually do all the work. I wanted you to get some recognition. I just wish you two and Greg didn't have to talk like three illiterates. The trio turned and re-entered the Institute through the large double doors to the Grand Foyer. In front of them was the curved staircase that led up to the offices, living quarters, and laboratories, with a door to the left leading to the lounge, the door to the right leading to the kitchen and the dining room, and another staircase under the big one that led downstairs to the hangar and garage. Della Mays was coming down the big stairs as they entered. The petite blonde wore a dark blue dress with a brooch that had three interlocking L's, symbolizing Ticonderoga's three big L's, the mantra of look, listen, and learn. You know it is what they expect, yes? Secundo was saying. If I speak too well, they don't think of me anymore. And when they observe a Chinaman, Chowlin added, they do not anticipate an ability to speak the language as if he were a native. Della laughed as she got to the bottom of the stairs. You don't sound like no native I ever met, Chowlin. And that's another thing, Beck said. They wouldn't even talk to Della and Mary. Of course not, Della said. They never cared what I thought back when I was handling Secundo's finances. They ain't gonna care now. Heck, they just figured Al did all his books, not the dumb blonde. You are not a dumb blonde, pal, Beck said with a sigh. To John Q. Public, all blondes are dumb. She shrugged. I'm used to it. As long as the check's clear, I can give a damn. Oh, speaking of that, uh, the check came in from Republic for the latest movie serial. They're starting production next week. You need to, to endorse it so I can deposit it tomorrow when I go to the bank. Beck nodded. Sure, right after I get out of the monkey suit. Also, while you guys were gabbing with the movie tone jokers, we got two calls. Secundo Al called, says he needs to talk to you about getting new punching bags for the gym. And the feds called. They said Agent Cop would be coming by today, around 4.30 or so. Secundo nodded. I will return Alberto's call after I, too, have removed my uh, monkey suit. The ex-boxer headed upstairs to go use the telephone to talk to Alberto Randazzo, who had been Secundo's manager throughout his boxing career. After Secundo retired, Randazzo opened a gymnasium in Manhattan, which he and Secundo managed together, mostly because Randazzo had no business sense. While everyone assumed that Randazzo had handled Secundo's money, as most managers did for boxers, it was Della who managed the boxer's finances. She had been the one to invest in government bonds rather than standard stocks, which meant that Secundo was one of the few who didn't lose everything in October of 1929. It was also Secundo's money that enabled them to start the stalwart squad four years earlier. Mary Johnson came in from the kitchen then, an apron over her house dress. I hear Della Ray. Cop is coming by today? Beck nodded. Yeah, probably has another mission for us that the FBI just can't handle. Good. I finally got the knockout gas he'd been bugging us about working right, so you need to show it to him. Wincing, Beck said, Oh, God, can't you do it? Every time I show off one of your ga gases or potions, I expect it to blow up in my face. No, I can't do it. I'm the damn cook, remember? Oh, speaking of that, it's pork chops tonight. Beck felt his mouth water. Mary Johnson was a brilliant biochemist, graduating at the top of her class at Columbia University. But because she was a colored woman, no one in the sciences would give her the time of day. Her brother faced the same problem after he acquired his degree in mechanical engineering from Cornell University. Because they couldn't get the patent office to take their work seriously, Beck had registered their creations as his own, and the money from the patents continued to fund the stalwart squad's work. 
It meant that, as far as the world was concerned, Mary was just the cook. However, she was a fabulous cook, and her pork chops were particularly magnificent, stuffed as they were with breadcrumbs and herbs. Chowlin had already departed the foyer, as usual, without anybody noticing, and Mary went back into the kitchen. Beck followed Della upstairs. Her office wall was covered with framed newspaper pages of the stalwart squad's various exploits, or rather, according to the headlines, Ticonderoga Beck's exploits. Rarely was the squad given credit, which continued to stick in Beck's craw. His eyes fell on one of the newspaper articles that didn't mention him by name, but it was probably the most important, because it's what got the squad started. It was the September 9, 1934 edition of the New York Herald Tribune story about the arrest of Joseph Snyder, Jr., Bronx. Monty's Soda Shop, Bronx, New York, 7 August 1934. It is good to be within these walls once again, Chow Lin said as he entered the soda shop on Grand Concourse in the Bronx for the first time since he was a teenager. Beck smiled as the Chinaman came to join him, Greg, and Mary at their favorite table. He was wearing black, just like the rest of them had for the funeral, in his case a simple suit. As he sat, Chow Lin said, I am pleased to see you all again. Same here, Mary said, putting a hand on Chow Lin's. Uncle Monty always liked you. Your uncle was the only shop owner who treated my family and I with respect and kindness. He treated everyone with respect and kindness, Beck said. That's why, he always, that's why we always came here. Greg smirked. Well... Mary and me came here because he always gave us free sodas because we was family. Mary smacked her brother gently on the arm. You stop talking foolishness, Greg. Beck chuckled. I can't believe Secundo actually came to the funeral. Wouldn't it be great if he came by the shop, too? Snorting, Greg said, No way slugging Secundo has time for us little people no more. From the door, a familiar deep voice said, But Gregory, my friend, everyone is little people. Turning, Beck saw that Secundo was coming into the shop, Della at his side, though her five-foot frame was barely noticeable left next to the behemoth that was the former heavyweight boxing champion. The pair joined them at the table. What's gonna happen to the what's gonna happen to the place? Della asked. Mary sighed. Our worthless cousin inherits it, but she don't want it. Says she don't know nothing about running no soda shop, so she's selling it. Pity, Chowlin said. This shop is a beacon of hope in the neighborhood one of the few in these dark times. Well, well, it must have been pretty bad, Della said, if Monty went and hung himself. Greg and Mary both winced. At the funeral, everyone had been avoiding talking about the manner of Monty Johnson's death, but Della's indiscreet utterance proved to be the perfect entree for what Beck wanted to say. Listen, I know the coppers said that it was suicide, but I don't think I'd buy it. What you mean, Ty? Greg asked. Beck took a breath. Look, I know I ain't the smartest guy on the block. You guys haven't been here. Secundo's had his boxing career with Della helping him. Greg and Mary went off to college. Chow Lin moved to California. But I stuck around, and I've seen lots of people bugging Monty more and more every year. Especially Slimy Snyder and his dad. They all exchanged looks. Joseph Snyder III was the neighborhood bully, and he never hesitated to harass them when they were all kids coming to the soda shop. And his father was a prominent businessman who had been good friends with Mayor Walker and was still good friends with Governor Lehman. I think that Slimy Snyder's dad killed Monty, but I can't prove it, and the cops won't bother to investigate because they think it's suicide. But you guys are the smartest people I've ever met. Maybe you can prove it. Prunella Mann Institute, New Paltz, New York, 5 July, 1938. They had all agreed to help find out who killed Greg and Mary's uncle. And three weeks later, Joseph Snyder Jr. was arrested for multiple murders. It turned out that Monty was, also, was one of several colored people Snyder had lynched over the years. Secundo had been the one to connect all the events. Chow Lin had interrogated some of Snyder's associates, and Greg and Mary were able to uncover some physical evidence in the apartment over the shop that pr proved that Monty hadn't hung himself. When it came time to present the evidence to NYPD Commissioner Orion, it was decided that it should be Beck, a six-foot-two, brown-haired, brown-eyed Caucasian, who did so, rather than a chink, a dago, a Pollock, and two coloreds. Greg and Mary had been stifled in their attempts to pursue careers in mechanical engineering and biochemistry. 
Since he was a child, speaking very broken English after emigrating to the U.S., everyone had assumed that Secundo was a big, dumb lout. Chaolin's opportunities were limited by his race, and as for Della, everyone had assumed her to be Secundo's girlfriend, and there was no avoiding the consequences of that assumption. As members of the stalwart squad, though, they could do what they did best, with everyone believing that Beck was the leader and the brains and the inventor. Beck loved that they did so much good. He just wished that the others could get proper credit for it. He endorsed the check from Republic, looked over the artwork that had been couriered over from the Eisner Iger studio for the Ticonderoga Beck comic magazine, and tried his best to follow Mary's demonstration of how to work the knockout gas so he could show it off to Agent Cuff. Which was good, as the Fed himself arrived right on time at 4.30, driving up the long, winding road in his Ford V8 sedan. Beck met him out front and shook the agent's hand as he exited the vehicle. Good to see you, pal. You too, Ty. Cop returned the handshake vigorously. The pair entered the double doors emblazoned with a stylized B. Cop wore a simple gray suit while Beck had changed into a turtleneck, slacks, and boots. So I've got some good news for your boys in the scientific crime detection lab. I finally got a handle on that knockout gas. Uh, that's great, Ty. Cop said quickly. Hey, what's with the long face there, pal? You've been after me to get you this gas for months. Didn't you tell me your boss only lets us do what we do because I give him such great toys to play with? Yeah, but right now? Director Hoover wants to string you up. Beck led Kopf into the lounge. He pulled a pack of Chesterfields out of his back pocket. Cigarette? Thanks, Kopf said. After pulling two out of the pack, he put them both in his mouth and walked over to the drinks cabinet where there was a book of matches. He lit both cigarettes and handed one to Kopf. As the Fed took a seat on the couch, Beck asked, Drink? No, thanks. Well, I think I'm going to need one if I've cheesed Hoover off. While Beck yanked the cork out of a bottle of scotch, Kopf said, There's a problem with the radio show. The last five broadcasts, there were reports of people going crazy and getting violent when they were listening to it. It took a while to put the pattern together, but there have been two dozen incidents, all taking place in homes with radios between the hours of 6 and 7 p.m. on Monday nights. Chesterfield is talking about pulling their sponsorship. Beck threw back a slug of the scotch he'd just poured before asking, Why is this the first time hearing of this? Kopf shrugged and took a puff of his cigarette. Damned if I know, but you may need to buy a new brand of cigarettes. Chuckling, Beck said, Pie? They give me a box a week for free. Part of the sponsorship deal. Then his face grew serious. We'll get into this. Holding up a hand, Kopf said, No, no. I'm just here to fill you in as a courtesy. And for the record, it's a courtesy Director Hoover didn't want me to extend. But I insisted. This is an active FBI case. I'm here to tell you not to stick your noses into it, okay, Ty? Well, I appreciate that, pal. Beck tried to sound sincere as he said that. Kopf smiled. Good. Now show me this knockout gas. Prunella Man Institute, New Paltz, New York, 7 July, 1938. Within half an hour of Kopf's departure from the Institute with a sample of the knockout gas, Della was on the phone with the Mutual Broadcasting System to request the master tapes of the last five episodes to air, as well as a list of everyone who was involved in the making of them. When Secundo had asked Della to do that, Beck had said, Hang on, pal. Kopf just told us to lay off. He was just informing us as a courtesy. We have a responsibility, Secundo said. This is your reputation, Ty. You cannot leave it in the hands of the government. Two days later, the tapes arrived, shipped from WXYZ in Detroit, where the show was recorded. The stalwart squad gathered in the laboratory to listen to them. Greg put the tape into the machine and adjusted the dials on his own audio equipment to try to detect any anomalies in what came out of the tape machine's speakers. The rest of the squad just listened. After a brief bit of string music, the distinctive deep voice of actor Matthew Rex, which, it had to be said, sounded absolutely nothing like Beck's lighter tones, spoke the same words he spoke at the top of every episode. Remember, look, listen, and learn. Then the friendly voice of announcer J.T. Clarkson said, Chesterfield presents Ticonderoga Beck, fighter for freedom and defender of the downtrodden. Tonight, Beck faces his latest challenge, the Candy Killer. Greg was shaking his head while Clarkson was reading an ad for Chesterfield cigarettes. Who comes up with all this nonsense? Della chuckled. They got writers, same as all the other shows. Yeah, but what the hell's a candy killer? We would have to listen to it to... Secundo started, but then started to trail off. Beck turned to face the former boxer. You all right, pal? But Secundo didn't answer. 
Instead, he lowered his head, covering his face with his hands. Walking over to him, Beck said, Hey, pal, come on, what's... Beck was unable to finish the sentence as Secundo hauled off and belted him. He didn't even see it coming. One moment he was reaching out to his childhood friend, and the next he was laying on the floor of the lab, looking up at the ceiling, the entire right side of his face hurting like hell. A scream filled the room, barely recognizable as a guttural version of Secundo's usual pleasant tenor. Pulling himself up into a sitting position, Beck saw Secundo screaming and flailing. Greg, Mary, and Della were all moving away from him. Beck couldn't see Chowlin. And then, out of nowhere, Chowlin appeared behind Secundo and got him in an arm lock. Then he kicked the boxer in the leg, which caused Secundo to collapse to his, to his knees. Only then was Chowlin able to get the much taller Secundo into a chokehold. Within moments, the former heavyweight champion lay unconscious on the floor. Nice job, pal, Beck said to Chowlin. What the fuck was that? Della asked. Greg had stopped the recording and was now rewinding the tape. Give me a minute. He put, a set, he put on a set of headphones and plugged the wire into the tape machine, then flipped several switches. He started to play the tape again, but the sound was only going to his ears. Having clambered to his feet, Beck rubbed his right cheek and said, What do we do with him? Mary snorted. I ain't carrying him. Chowlin said he will be fine when he awakens, assuming that whatever caused him to go berserk is not still affecting him. Then he looked at Beck. Let me see your face. Beck lowered his hand and allowed the physician to examine the right side of his head. You will be well, Chowlin said after a moment. There will be a bruise on your cheek, but I believe you shall be able to claim that you obtained it while pursuing malefactors. With a chuckle, Beck said, wouldn't be the first time. Greg said, yeah, okay. He removed the headphones and stopped the tape. That's what I was thinking when Ty told us about this nonsense two days ago. There's an undertone in the recording, something that might affect people with a really high range of hearing. Lord have mercy, Mary muttered. Someone figured it out? Greg nodded. Figured what out? Beck asked. Mary put her hands on her hips. She looked angry as hell. Back when I was at Columbia, some damn fool of a white boy has tried to get me kicked out of the university because I'm colored. He was doing work with auditory stimulation, like what Greg was just talking about. But he was having trouble making his notions work. If he kept at it... Chow Lin turned to Della. You obtained a list of those who worked on the dramatic presentation, yes? Della nodded and reached for her purse. She removed two sheets of paper that were folded over and held together with a clip and handed them to Mary. After looking up and down the list, she smiled. There he is, Paul Latsko. He's the audio engineer. Frowning, Della said, that ain't right. Audio engineer is Carl Ricker, or at least it was. Perhaps he is new to the job, Jalen said. I believe we should track down the address of this Paul Latsko and have words with him. Apartment of Paul Latsko, Detroit, Michigan, 9 July, 1938. It took Della a day to obtain the address of Paul Latsko and another day to file a flight plan for Monty's honor to fly from the private airfield behind the Institute to Detroit City Airport, where they had rented a berth in one of the hangars. However, when they arrived at the apartment building on Woodward Avenue near Merchant's Row, they found a police officer stationed at the front door. State your business, please the officer said, a stern expression on his very pale face. Then he stared at Beck and his eyes widened. Wait! You're, you're that fellow from the cereals, uh, uh, Cuyahoga Beck! Smiling his most pleasant smile, Beck said, Ticonderoga Beck, but yes. Reaching out to shake Beck's hand, the officer said, It's a great pleasure to be making your acquaintance, Mr. Beck, sir. I'm Officer Sean McHenry, Detroit Police Department, at your service, sir. Returning the handshake, Beck said, Thank you very much, Officer McHenry. Looking at the others, McHenry said, Oh, and these lads and lassies must be your standard squad. Stalwart squad, Beck gently corrected. I think you can help us, pal. We need to see Paul Latsko. McHenry's face fell. Oh, sir, that may be a bit of a problem, as Mr. Latsko has recently passed from this earth, you see. Beck looked back at Secundo, who exchanged a concerned glance with Chow Lin. What happened to him? Beck asked. Committed suicide, he did, sir, and quite grisly it was. I'm afraid that's why I'm stationed here, sir. The suicide only happened a few hours ago, and the coroner hasn't been by to fetch the body. Beck leaned in and spoke in a conspiratorial whisper. I don't suppose we could get a look at the victim's apartment, could we? Well, McHenry said slowly, obviously considering his options, scratching his chin. If to anyone else, I'd say no as a matter of course, but seeing as how it's yourself, Mr. Beck, sir, I would have to say have at it. 
It says apartment number four, and the door's open, seeing as how the lock was broken when we went in this morning. Thank you very much, pal. We really appreciate it. As everyone moved toward the front door, the officer suddenly said, Wait, sir! I'm sorry, but I can't be having all of you going up. Ju just Mr. Beck. Thinking quickly, Beck said, I can't go anywhere without my bodyguard, and I need Chow Lin to accompany me as well. Again, he leaned in close. He's an Oriental. He has abilities far beyond what us Easterners can manage. Eyes wide, McHenry said, Oh, sure, and I've heard that about those chinks. All right, then, but the coons and the girl need to stay behind. He'll be fine, Mr. Beck, Greg said in his public voice. We'd just be waiting down here for you. He was also visibly holding Mary back as he said it. His sister obviously wanted to go in. She was the one who'd had the run-in with Latsko back in college, after all. But it wouldn't do to antagonize the officer. With a nod to Greg, Mary, and Della, Beck went in, followed by Secundo and Shaolin. Beck was winded by the time he made it up the four flights of stairs, but both his companions were perfectly fine. Staring at the front door with its smashed lock and which was slightly ajar, Secundo said, I see the police were as subtle as ever. By the time Beck got his breath back and went inside, Secundo and Shaolin were already inspecting the small apartment. A body that was intact from the neck down and sat in an easy chair. The head was covered in blood, particularly in the neck and chin. A shotgun lay on the side of the chair. The chair itself was also covered in blood. Chowlin was looking over the body, while Secundo was looking around the rest of the large living room area. This man did not commit suicide, Chowlin said. I was fast, Beck said with a small smile. Just so I know what to tell people, how did you know? There is a smell on his breath that matches that of an exotic poison that only comes from a plant that grows in the Rocky Mountain region. Beck knew better than to even question Shaolin, as he was one of the world's form foremost authorities on poisons. Instead, he said, Rocky Mountains doesn't exactly narrow it down. This does. Secundo was holding up a ripped open envelope that he had removed from a garbage can. A package for Senor Latsko from a post office in Calgary. He handed it to Shaolin. I am receiving a smell from this package that is not what I would expect from garbage. Chalin took the package and took a sniff. It is the same smell that is on the victim's breath. Secundo looked at Beck. It would seem our next destination must be Calgary, which puts us well out of the jurisdiction of Agent Kopf and his colleagues. Fine, Beck said with a sigh. You were right, as usual, pal. Good thing we all have our passports. We should return downstairs, Secundo said, as I do not believe that Officer McHenry wishes to be proximate to our friends for much longer. Yeah, good call, pal. The Fairmont Palliser Hotel, Calgary, Alberta, 12 July, 1938. A huge gaggle of press were waiting outside the Fairmont Palliser Hotel as Beck and the rest of the squad exited down the stairs that led from the revolving front door to the Ninth Avenue sidewalk. Beck smiled as he approached the men and women of the Fourth Estate, who were all scribbling madly in their notebooks as he spoke. What brings you to Canada, Ty? A secret mission, pal, Beck said, one we're not really at liberty to discuss. We heard you well in here from Detroit. Secundo had figured that the arrival of Monty's honor at the Rutledge hangar was what prompted the press to show up at the hotel, and if this reporter knew their flight plan, it all but confirmed that their arrival by air was what got this particular ball rolling. Aloud, all Beck said was, Gotta refuel somewhere, don't we? Where you off to now? I'm gonna take a little trip to the mountains with my new ornithopter. Is that another one of your inventions, Ty? A very tiny part of Beck was tempted to give Greg the credit he deserved for building the ornithopter, as making an engine that would be able to flap the wings of a tiny aircraft was a tremendous accomplishment. But, leaving aside any other considerations, giving Greg that credit would jeopardize the patent, which was, of course, in Beck's name. So he simply replied, You bet, pal. We're going to take it into the mountains for a spin. What's in the mountains there, Ty? With his widest smile, Beck said, That's the secret mission, pal. You'll hear all about it once it's done, I promise you that. That's all I got. He added quickly before another reporter could ask a question. Remember, look, listen, and learn. Della had summoned a cab while he was talking to the reporters, and the six of them piled into it and were taken back to the Rutledge hangar. Too bad the new airport ain't open yet, Greg said as the cab winded its way down Ninth Avenue toward McLeod Trail. Been itching to take a gander at how they're going to run it. Mary rolled her eyes. Who gives a damn about some airport? She looked at Della. You sure it's Slimy Slider? Della nodded. I couldn't get the post office to tell me whose P.O. box it was, so I went to public records. There's a huge house up in the mountains in Banff that's got the P.O. box as their mailing address. And it's owned by Swell Solutions, a corporation that's got a president and CEO named Joseph Snyder III. 
Chowlin added, the house in question is near a very large concentration of the poison plant that killed Paul Latzko. They sat in the cab in silence after that. Della had already told them all this in the hotel room, and Mary obviously hadn't entirely believed it. Neither did Beck. I can't believe Slimy Snyder would do something like this. I mean, he was a creep, but still. We put his father in jail, Secundo said, and whoever it was who had Latzko use his auditory stimulation did so specifically with the Ticonderoga Beck show. I do not believe that is a coincidence, no? Both Snyder and Latzko had animus against the stalwart squad. I wouldn't go that far about Latzko, Mary said. I doubt that fool even remembers me. I was just some tar baby he didn't like, and I don't believe he cares enough to even notice Ty's cook, much less realize it's the same girl. Nodding, Secundo said, perhaps. But we do know that Senor Snyder III did not like us even before he put his father in jail. I think we are being targeted, in which case the wisest course is for us to target him in return. The Snyder Mountain Estate, Banff, Alberta, 12 July, 1938. Beck stumbled out of the ornithopter and tried very hard not to throw up. Greg flew the ornithopter beautifully through the mountains, dealing with all the updrafts and wind shifts and such as they increased their altitude. But it was a very turbulent ride, and Beck's stomach was doing the Charleston. They had made a very soft landing on the rear end of the plateau, behind a large house that was owned by Swell Solutions. But that was the softest part of the entire trip, and Beck was extremely grateful to be back on solid ground. The others all exited the ornithopter a bit more gracefully. Beck straightened and took a good look at the house that apparently held their childhood nemesis. It was a Victorian with a large balcony on the second floor and a turret in front. There is movement in the house, Chalun said without preamble. Secundo frowned. Then our foe, he knows we are here. He gave Chalun a look, and the latter nodded and moved away. Though the verb to move was inadequate. One moment Chowlin was standing there, and the next he wasn't. We don't know that he knows we're here, Greg said. My bird is quiet. Maybe, Mary said, but it ain't like a flying ship lands in your backyard every morning, especially up here in the middle of the damn nowhere, no matter how quiet. The move! A voice bellowed from above. Beck looked up and saw four men holding Thompson machine guns. They all had blonde or light brown hair, cut short and close like military men. Secundo whispered, Plan G. After giving an infinitesimal nod, Beck threw up his hands. We're not moving! Not resisting at all, please! Don't shoot! I just want to talk to your boss. One of the gun wielders, who had a pencil-thin mustache, smiled and said, Oh, he wants to talk to you too, eh? Three more men came around from the front of the house, also holding Thompson's. Ian, you go ahead and take Beck to see Mr. Snyder. Put the rest of them in the wine cellar. As Ian and his two colleagues moved closer, Secundo interpolated himself between them and Beck. Hey, where Senor Beck go, I go, huh? Back off, Dago, Ian said, holding up his gun. Beck was starting to think that Plan G was going to be a bus, but then one, the one with the mustache said, Fine, bring the WAP along, too, but put the girls and the Negro downstairs. As Ian said, Come on! Beck thought that Plan D would have been okay, but he preferred to have Secundo with him in these circumstances. Both Beck and Secundo gave encouraging looks to Greg, Mary, and Della. Beck's look was more for the benefit of Ian and the other mercenaries. Secundo's was the one that actually reassured them. The one with the mustache met them inside the front door, which was a narrow foyer that led to an even narrower hallway. Ian took Della, Greg, and Mary downstairs. Secundo and Beck, meanwhile, were led further down the hall to what looked like a dining room. Several maps were laid out on the table, along with some blueprints. Standing at the head of it were the now grown-up form of the young man who tormented all of them during their mutual childhoods. His blonde hair, which had been curly when they were kids, was now slicked back, and he had a mustache in a similar style to that of his apparent chief of security. The blue eyes bore into Beck as he and Secundo entered. Well, well, well. If it ain't tied up in knots, Beck and his dopey Dago sidekick. About time you two showed up, Ty. I was starting to think I'd have to write an engraved invitation. Beck regarded Snyder with annoyance. You wanted me here, pal? I ate your pal, Ty, and yeah, I wanted you here. Look, I could have used any radio show to test the mind ripper, but I used yours on purpose. See, I'm still kind of browned off about what you did to Dad. Your dad killed Monty, pal. Sorry, Joe. Or should I just go back to calling you Slimy Snyder? Doesn't matter what you call me, Ty. Snyder walked around to the table to confront Beck face to face. Because what I'm going to call you is dead. You put Dad in jail, and for what? A colored soda shop owner? That place was a dump. The sodas were watery, and everyone hated it. Well, 
Except you and your stupid friends like Slug and Secundo over here. Once Snyder got within a yard of Vec, Secundo stepped between them. Not too close, eh? He added several words in Italian that Vec didn't know. He'd been trying to learn the language with little success, though he did recognize the word bastardo. The mercenaries then immediately stepped in and tried to hit Secundo. However, the X-Boxer grabbed the mercenary's fist before it could collide with his stomach and started to squeeze. Three other mercenaries then also attacked, one going after his head with the butt of his Thompson gun. Moments later, Secundo was slumped over the dining room table while three of the four mercenaries were laying on the ground, moaning. Shaking his head, Snyder led back to the other side of the room while more mercenaries came in to help the fallen ones. Secundo remained slumped over the table. I never did get why you associate with those mongrels. Negroes, women, chinks, dagos. They make you feel more like a man or something? You wouldn't understand, Beck said truthfully. Well, it doesn't matter. I've got friends over in Europe who are really going to love using this mind river. They're going to pay me lots of money for it, and I don't have to pay the fellow that invented it, since poor son of a bitch killed himself. Nice try, pal, but I know you killed Latsko. <laughs> Good luck proving that, especially since you'll be dead as a doornail. Nah, I doubt that, pal. Snyder laughed derisively. <laughs> really? I could have had you shot when you landed that stupid wing thing behind my house, but I wanted to actually tell you that I was the one who brought you down. More fun for me. Sorry you won't live to see my clients take over Europe with the Mind River. Clients? That's right. Germany ain't gonna lose this war, pal. I'm gonna make sure of it. Too bad you ain't gonna live to see it. Snyder walked over to a bureau, opened a drawer, and pulled out a revolver. Just as he was pointing it at Beck's chest, his face started to scrunch up. What's that smell? Now Beck was starting to catch the odor as well. He almost answered Snyder's question with Plan G, but before he could even consider whether or not to reveal that, a meaty hand grabbed the revolver and the hand holding it. Secundo was standing next to Snyder, using his grip on Snyder's hand to push his entire body down into a kneeling position. You have, uh, how you say, confessed the crime to Signor Beck. Big mistake. Secundo grinned. I've got two dozen more soldiers in my employ, and they are quite unconscious came Chow Lin's voice from the doorway to the dining room. Beck turned to see Chow Lin with Greg and Mary behind him. He quickly said, You should have searched my stalwart squad, pal. Then maybe you'd have seen the knockout gas pellets that I left with Mary. You also should have noticed that I was down one Chinaman. Sweat beating on his forehead. Secundo had yet to loosen his grip. Snyder said, I just figured he went back to Tokyo or wherever. Tokyo is in Japan. I was born in Shanghai. Chow Lin said simply, then he applied his hand to Snyder's neck, and a second later he fell unconscious. Only then did Secundo release his grip on the man's fist. As I suspected, Secundo said, now back in his normal voice, these blueprints are for a large-scale version of the Mind Ripper, and the maps show locations in Europe that, that are being targeted. London, Paris, Madrid, Warsaw, and Amsterdam. Della showed up then, coming into the dining room behind Greg, Mary, and Chow Lin, and removing a gas mask. Found some carbons of some lettuce Snyder, Slenny Snyder sent to our pal Latsko in Detroit, and some invoices for some purchases made for some krauts overseas. Plus, Secundo said with a smile, he confessed his crimes to the famous Ticonderoga Beck. Yes, he did. Beck blew out of breath. <sighs> nice job, pals. I love Plan G. Prunella Man Institute, New Paltz, New York, 15 July, 1938. Beck greeted Agent Koff as he drove up the long road to the Institute in his Ford V8, and his, it led him into the lounge for a drink and a cigarette. After taking a puff of his cigarette, Koff said, Director Hoover still wants to string you up. Beck finished pouring two drinks, then held out both hands, palms up. You kidding me, pal? We handed him someone who was going to use the radio to make people kill each other. Oh, no, he's happy that Snyder's been caught and that Mind Ripper gadget of his is out of play. Joseph Snyder III has been on the most wanted list for a couple of years now, thanks to some stuff that happened in Montana back in 35. No, the director wants to string you up because you turned Snyder over to the Mounties. Shaking his head, Beck passed the glass to Koff. Of course we turned him over to the RCMP. We were in Canada. It's their jurisdiction. Besides, Snyder and his goon squad didn't fit in the ornithopter, so we needed the Mounties to take him into custody. Beck didn't ask that every member of the contingent of RCMP officers who arrested Snyder and his goons wanted his autograph. Did uh, Hoover want us to violate international extradition treaties? Between you, me, and the lamppost? Absolutely he did. He hates dealing with the Canucks. On top of that, you were specifically instructed not to get involved in this case. Beck sighed. Does this mean we're in trouble? Oh, goodness, no, not directly. 
I mean, the director asked me to tell you never to go off half-cocked like that again, an instruction that I told him you were guaranteed to ignore, and then to thank you on behalf of the Bureau for capturing Snyder and keeping the country safe. Holding up his glass, Beck said, Tell him he's welcome. Did he like the knockout gas? <laughs> you wouldn't say. He's got the boys in the lab going over it. My money's on them not being able to dope it out. They can never figure out your inventions, Ty. I guess I'm just that good. Koff took a gulp of his drink, then grinned. So how did you figure it out about Snyder? With a knowing smirk, Beck said, Plan G. I'm supposed to know what that is besides the one after Plan F? Oh, no, it's the one after Plan E. I got rid of Plan F a long time ago. Koff rolled his eyes as he puffed on a cigarette. So what is Plan G? Let everyone except Chow Lin get captured. He uses his oriental skills to stay out of sight while I get brought in to see the guy in charge and everyone else is imprisoned. Chow Lin frees the others, and they all use my knockout gas to take out the hired help while I get the guy in charge to confess. Beck gave a, the Fed a wide grin. Works every time. Then his face fell. Well, except that time in Brazil. But I substituted Plan Q and everything was fine. That still doesn't tell me how you knew Snyder was the guy. Oh, that was easy. Uh, I ran the tapes of that last batch of radio programs through my equipment here. I doped out an auditory stimulation edition that they were playing with at Columbia University a few years back. The radio program had a new audio engineer who was part of that project at Columbia. But when we went to Detroit to talk to him, he was already dead. Suicide, the cops said, but I smelled a very distinctive poison on his breath that could only come from the Rocky Mountains. He had a package from Calgary that had the same smell, so we flew up there and tracked down the address to the package that came from to Snyder's house in the mountains. Koff shook his head and finished his drink. You know, Ty, there are times when I think you're just making all this up. <laughs> Look, pal, the important part is we stopped a plot to use mind control on the good people of the world, and we've got our radio program back. Standing up, Koff groaned. I bet the second part's more important, right, Ty? <laughs> Honestly, I hate this show. The actor playing Secundo has a Spanish accent, not an Italian one, and they don't even include Greg Mary or Della. But you like the checks that come in, I assume. He handed Beck the empty drinks glass. Well, I'm heading back to the New York office. Always a pleasure, Ty. You always have the best scotch. After the Fed departed, driving his VA back down the long driveway, Beck saw that Secundo had joined him. There is no Plan Q, and Plan F is a perfectly viable plan. I was trying to make it sound convincing like you keep saying I should, pal. I suppose. And it is best that Agent Koff believes, as others do, that you are the brilliant mind behind it all. They walked back into the kitchen. Beck could smell Mary's roast chicken as they grew closer. I don't think it's best at all that you guys don't get the credit. The plans are all yours. It's Mary's knockout gas, and Greg built the ornithopter, and... <sighs> he sighed. They entered the kitchen. Greg, Della, and Chowlin were already seated at the table in front of the empty plates and filled wine glasses, while Mary was standing in the kitchen with a large fork and knife carving the chicken into pieces. About time you two were done with that fed, Mary said. Hoover liked the gas? Agent Kopp says he's withholding comment until his own lab boys go over it. But they probably won't be able to figure it out any more than they figured out any of your other inventions. Mary grinned. I guess I'm just that good. You all are. Beck grabbed the wine glass in front of his empty seat and held it up. To the stalwart squad, and another successful mission. While Mary came over to the table and grabbed her own drink, Greg added, To finally putting Slimy Snyder away along with his racialist daddy. Hear, hear, Della said. They all clinked their glasses and then all said in unison, Look! Listen! Learn! And then they all drank. Now, Mary said, Let's eat. I really hope that that is not the only Ticonderoga Beck story I write. Um, I've already written a proposal for a comic book, uh, which is currently under consideration by a comic book company. I'm waiting to hear back from them as I, as I record this. Um, and, uh, and I'd love to do, yeah, I'm teeming with ideas of what I want to do with this. So let's hope that happens. Um, thank you very much for watching. Uh, please subscribe to the channel if you don't already. Um, and please check me out online. If you go to decantado.net, it links to all the different places you can find me online, including my blog, my Facebook page, my Twitter feed, my Instagram, uh, my Wikipedia page, my stuffforTour.com, as well as my Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash cred. You should definitely support that. There's lots of cool stuff on it. Uh, I got lots of wonderful stuff coming out in 2023. Um, so please keep an eye on the webpage and on my social media and stuff like that. Thank you very much, and please stay safe.